thank you to Zoe and Yemi for being here for this conversation. And thanks to everyone who's um, shown up to listen today. Thank you to the Architecture Foundation for this really kind and generous invitation. Um, I'm joining you today from what's currently known as uh, Sackville, New Brunswick, Canada, which is on the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people with whom we're governed by ongoing treaties of peace and friendship here. Um, so yeah, so this, <laughs> this book that I'm going to give you a little synopsis of is called Feminist City, Claiming Space in a Man-Made World. It is published by Verso and Verso has their annual holiday sale on right now. So uh, might be a good time to go and check it out. I think they have a deal where if you buy the book, you get a free ebook as well. So um, I'd encourage you to check that out if you're interested. The book um, originally came out about a year ago here in Canada. And of course I wrote it long before the pandemic, but it's been a really interesting time in which to be kind of touring and speaking about the book because a lot of the themes that I touched on have suddenly become much more visceral in people's everyday lives. So thinking about the home, thinking about how we move through cities, the ways in which um, you know, care labor is divided up in our cities, uh, how people are paid for the work that they do, how people experience feelings of freedom and safety in cities, all of these conversations have taken on kind of a new lens in this particular time. So it's just been really fascinating to have these, these conversations right now. So Feminist City is, uh, so in my day job, um, I'm, I'm a professor, I'm a, um, what in, the, what in North America we would call an associate professor of um, geography and environment and also women's and gender studies. So in my day job, I talk about issues of um, space and power and gender in cities all the time to an audience of peers and, and also students. But I wanted to write this book to be one that was accessible to a wider audience of people, to really anyone who's ever lived in a city or loved cities or, or being to cities and really wondered how did they come to be the way they are? Why do people experience city life differently based on their own identity and so on? And to um, give people kind of a window into how power works through the built environment. So instead of just thinking about cities and our streets and public spaces and so on as kind of like stages where our social relations play out, to see the city itself, its buildings, its streets and so on as actually kind of an active participant in those social relations that's shaping all, all sorts of ways that we connect or perhaps disconnect with one another. So the book also in order to be accessible starts from some everyday experience experiences of mine. So I grew up outside uh, the city of Toronto, which is Canada's largest city and lived for uh, most of my life until I moved to New Brunswick for work in Toronto and also in London. And my experiences as first kind of a, a, a girl growing up in, in the city and around the city, then as a young woman and eventually a mother in cities offered me some particular insights into how gender in particular is experienced differently across, um, yeah, experienced differently. So the book also includes some kind of just my own stories of, of um, different things that have happened to me in cities, the ways that becoming a mother changed my relationship to the urban environment. And the reason that I did this is not only to be kind of like relatable to other people or to maybe offer a way that that others can sort of see, oh yeah, maybe that thing that happened to me or that way that I felt, it wasn't just me, I'm not alone. So that's part of it, but also because I think that uh, a feminist perspective is often one that starts from everyday experience. It starts from the body often and just how certain bodies are not really um, made, made to fit in the world. And we kind of come up against different sorts of barriers, both social barriers and physical barriers that remind us of our place where we're meant to be according to the you know, status quo and the prevailing social system. So starting from the everyday, starting from the body kind of allows us to maybe open up and ask some different questions about city life than are typically um, asked in sort of mainstream discourse. <clears throat> 
And throughout the book, uh, I do want to highlight that, of course, my experiences are not universal either to all women or, um, yeah, because obviously I, I embody certain particular privileges, including white skin, being able-bodied and, and cisgendered to name a few. And to both start with and then end with my perspective would be quite limited. So the book tries to offer in what we call an intersectional approach, one that encourages a way of trying to think both across difference, but also to see how different forms of power intersect in the city. So um, colonialism and settler colonialism, white supremacy, classism, ableism, homophobia, how these intersect with sexism and patriarchy as forms of power to create a different set of experiences that people have and to create different sorts of um, issues that we need to push back against. So I think some of that will come out in the discussion as we talk about particular issues. Uh, the book itself is kind of structured around, again, um, some of my own experiences. So we kind of start out with um, City of Moms, where I discuss the ways that my experience of becoming a mother while living in the city of London really opened my eyes to the ways that cities were not uh, particularly designed to be accommodating to anybody who is a caregiver, essentially. And that was kind of the first time that I was like, oh, there's something going on here. There's something particular about this environment that is not really set up to support me in this new role. And that kind of sparked my interest in um, taking a gendered perspective on cities. I also talk about friendship in the city as a way of maybe reimagining our relationships. And a bit later on, I'm going to read a little section from that chapter of the book. I also talk about the importance of being alone in the city for women who are regularly subjected to unwanted attention and harassment in, in urban spaces and how the kind of freedom of the anonymity and the, the flaneur experience of the urban environment has often been denied to women. So I, I just uh, explore why that, why that matters in, in this context. I also talk about activism in the city and, and the city is a space of protest and a place where social movements, including those around gender have um, been, have really taken off. And of course, we saw this summer with the resurgence of Black Lives Matter movements in cities, the importance of the urban environment for um, staging protests and raising awareness of different sorts of issues. And I also talk uh, about fear in the city and, and issues of safety and danger. I didn't want the whole book to focus on kind of women's negative experiences of the city. Cities are can be quite freeing and empowering, but at the same time, we know that issues around safety and danger, fear of crime, sexual harassment on in public spaces really do affect women's lives in a variety of ways from the psychological to the material in terms of how we kind of navigate our socialization into fear. So uh, that's kind of the last theme of the book before I talk uh, in a slightly more hopeful way about some of the city of possibility, some of the kinds of changes that we could imagine, some of the feminist values and principles that we might promote if we want to see a more equitable, sustainable, and just city. And again, I think some of those principles will emerge as the, the conversation moves forward with, with Yemi and Zoe. So I think that's uh, the end of my little synopsis for there. And, and we can move on to the next part of the conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. So um, just to start off by saying that this book is brilliant. At simply, simply, simply brilliant, really easy to digest, really relevant and refreshing. It really um, is a must read for those that haven't read it. So in our discussions tonight, we'll try not to give too much away um, for those of you that haven't yet read um, the book, but we will be discussing some key themes and we're going to kick off with um, housing and planning. So I'm going to start off by reading a mission and vision statement. So our vision is to make a positive difference to women's lives. Our mission is to provide homes and services which offer a springboard to independent women to achieve their potential. 
we aim to influence others to do the same. Now that mission and vision statement is from Women Pioneer Housing, um, WPHR Housing Association, and I'm very proud to sit on their board. They were established in 1920, so 100 years ago, and yes, we're still on this issue. Um, <laughs> women Pioneer Housing are now um, London's largest specialist housing association for women. They were established by women and men, so a collective effort, um, who wanted to redress the disadvantages women experience in obtaining and retaining a secure home. So let me go through some key facts and figures to try and contextualize the issue of housing um, for women. So women continue to earn less than men on average in Britain today. Women are much more likely to work part-time or in precarious jobs due to caring responsibilities. The mean gap of full-time workers is 13.1% and when part-time workers are included, this widens to 16.2%. The situation is worse for women facing intersectional, intersectional inequalities, so i.e. Black, Asian and ethnic minority women, older women and some with disabilities. As an example, when the overall gender pay gap for women was 18.2%, for Bangladeshi and Pakistani women it was 23%. Um, income inequality builds up over a lifetime. The private pension pots of women in their 60s are on average a third of the size of men's, Older women are three times more likely than men to retire on just the basic state pension. Now, this one really gets me. Um, there is no region in England where private rented housing is affordable on women's median earnings. For men, median incomes make private rented housing affordable in all regions except for in London. Um, the organisation Safe Life estimates that each year 1.9 million people in the UK suffer from domestic abuse, 1.3 million of those are women. Seven women a month are killed by a current and former partner in England and Wales, and 85% of those experiencing 10 or more severe incidents of domestic violence from a perpetrator were women. Now, there have been so many heartbreaking and negative consequences of COVID-19, and one of these has been the in domestic violence. Leslie, in the um, Guardian article you wrote in July this year and in the book, you discuss the fact that violence against women when it's given attention in our cities is generally along the lines of women facing stranger danger in public. However, the reality of it is, um, based on the facts and figures that I've just presented, that the vast majority of violence, including fatal violence against women and girls worldwide, is perpetrated in the home, and very unfortunately, lockdown has made matters worse. Um, in presenting all of these issues, though, what are we going to do about it? And Leslie, you pick up on this very nicely in the article where you state that the good news is that women haven't been twiddling their thumbs waiting for city planners or politicians to solve these problems. And that actually women have been devising solutions, adapting and proposing designs for cities and homes for well over a century. And you gave the example of Jane Adams in 1889, who um, founded the Hull House in Chicago, a social settlement for younger married women and immigrants who needed a safe home and a sense of community. And I've given another example of the fantastic work Women Pioneer Housing have been doing for over 100 years um, to redress some of those inequalities. Um, so Leslie, um, I've tried to contextualise part of the issue, so it would be great if you could spend some time maybe expanding on this point and perhaps providing us with some um, examples of places such as Kigali, um, Aspen, Tokyo, Sweden, where you cite in your book where positive and practical and very actionable interventions have been made to make um, women feel included and send the message that they are um, welcome in the city. Thank you so much for, for providing all of that context. I, I think the issue of housing kind of can't be underscored enough when we talk about the, the feminist city. I mean, housing, shelter, this is an absolutely a, a basic need, and yet women find themselves in very precarious housing situations. The situation is the same. In Canada, women are much more likely to be precariously housed in unaffordable, unsuitable, or unsafe housing arrangements here. And all, for all of the same reasons that you gave a wage gap, more likely to be single parents, all of those sorts of issues. I think the, uh, the issue around domestic violence uh, has become more visible in public discourse during the time of COVID uh, here in Canada, right away when the first hints of a lockdown were, were 
um, coming through the media, women's organizations were saying, this is going to be a domestic violence crisis. And so the federal government did up the amount of money going to the shelter system. But I think what you point to, Yemi, is that there is kind of a bigger problem, which is that often our attention is uh, not located on the home as a site of, of danger, as a site of unsafety, as a site of inequality. We tend to uh, want to promote warm and fuzzy visions of the home. We want to assume that everyone has a home, that the home is a safe space, that the home can be a place where children are homeschooled and looked after and fed while everybody does their work from home job. All of these assumptions we've seen really bubble to the surface in the time of, of COVID. And what I, what I want to encourage people to think about in this period is all of the ways in which the current dominant forms of housing that are centered on the traditional nuclear family, the patriarchal family, are not serving uh, women, especially particularly well. And so the question is, what sorts of interventions can we imagine uh, going back all the way to Jane Addams and, and extending into the future? I mean, I think there's examples in many cities now of co-housing movements, which are both meant to be a more like sustainable and green way of living so that people share collective space for cooking, cleaning, laundry, those sorts of things. And that is also a way of collectivizing care work, which I think has a lot of potential and is probably much more environmentally sustainable. We see movements where new housing developments are designed around the fact that um, caregiving work needs to happen and it needs to not be kind of segregated just to the private home. So gender mainstreaming initiatives in cities like Vienna have made sure that new developments are located close to services that people need. They're located close to, you know, groceries and pharmacies. They're near schools. They're near healthcare. They're not um, like you can also take care of, you know, 15 minutes to half hour proximity. Public transit has to run um, through these residential areas at all times. So not cutting housing off from the rest of the city. Um, some of the other interventions that we're Seeing, I mean, even again in the time of the pandemic, these were not specifically feminist responses, but the way that governments suddenly realized that they could do things like um, prevent evictions if they wanted to pass that legislation, that they could do things like um, cap rent increases, that they could provide um, a version of universal basic income to people. So I think we're seeing that, that some of these things that have, many of us, our governments have told us it's too expensive, we can't do it, it's, it's too problematic, the market won't allow it. Well, actually maybe, maybe we can do it because these are the things that people have long needed and will need for a long time after the pandemic as well. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. And I think that that acknowledgement really importantly as well is that the, the kind of things we're talking about now is not just a woman's issue. You know, the society as a whole benefits um, when women are allowed to participate fully using their skills and experience effectively. Um, so um, we're going to move on now to the next theme that we want to explore. And it's important, however, to, of course, note that all the themes we'll be discussing are all correlated and fit into the into the bigger picture. So um, the next segment of our conversation is that of power and who writes the city. Again, I'm going to start with um, a bit of a quote from your Guardian article where you state that to imagine the city and its structure as neutral places where complicated human social interactions are staged is to ignore the simple fact that people built places. As the feminist Jane Dark has said, our cities are patriarchy written in stone, brick, glass and concrete. In other words, cities reflect the norms of the societies that build them and sexism is a deep rooted norm. So when I consider the making of space or writing the city from the perspective of being an architect, um, typically architectural services are often only available to those that have the financial means, those with power, um, housing, the public realm, as well as transport and infrastructure is currently disproportionately influenced and controlled by the agenda of the well-to-do and the powerful and to a lesser degree um, professionals. Um, However, if we link this again to 
housing, when we talk about the greatest need, which is affordable housing, and that's a global need, a large number of those that inhabit these buildings and spaces don't often have the opportunity to shape how they want to live. Um, so when we talk about power, how do we democratize the design process, housing production, and the business of um, housing? Um, so I, I'll touch on a few things quite specifically in relation to housing and to start us off and um, it would then be great for us to touch on power more, more broadly too. So in terms of affordable housing providers, which you touch on in the book and which is currently an area that I operate in, I think over the last few years, there have been quite positive steps taken into developing an approach that focuses on local, tangible and practical um, issues. Um, that mean that um, meaningful resident and stakeholder um, engagement can take place and the democratization through engagement with a wider stage um, or range of stakeholders also means that what has traditionally been um, a domain reserved for the um, experts um, can be opened up and that balance of power made slightly more equal through a process of um, co-creation and I think the democratization of design through engagement um, um, it's just a fantastic way that we should continue to, to try and um, proceed. In terms of housing more um, broadly and globally, one really interesting concept uh, in relation to who designs the city is open sourced um, design, which has the intention of narrowing the gap between the demand for architecture and access to its um, production. So in this sphere, architects and designers have made efforts to uh, redemocratize housing design and production. So one example of this is um, WikiHouse, um, which is a digitally manufactured building system that uses an online database and crowdsourced architectural designs for homes um, that can mainly be fabricated with a router and plywood, with exception to some off the shelf products. But the concept is to make it simple for people to design, manufacture and assemble high performance homes that are customised um, to their needs. And the guiding principle behind WikiHouse is that architecture should be designed by the people, for the people and is motivated by um, a rejection of commercial large scale housing development strategies. Um, so Leslie, you also explore power in other ways such as, and you touched on it uh, um, earlier actually, such as power relationships and women's desires in the cities and the importance of taking an intersectional approach when asking certain women's questions about the city. And there's also a fascinating section of the book where you explore patriarchy um, and you touch on the director of um, urban design for Toronto, Lorna Day, who found that the city's guidelines for wind effects assumes a standard person whose height, weight and surface area corresponds to an average um, male. So here we see that gender bias influences the height and um, position of skyscrapers um, so, <laughs> and the development of wind tunnels, really abstract. Um, but you also touch on power in relation to women's fr uh, friendship. So all really fascinating things. It would be great if we could hear from you on, on some of those things. Sure, thank you. I mean, there's, yeah, an absolutely endless array of things that we could talk about with respect to how power is operating. But again, yeah, one of the points of the book is to give people a way of noticing power in places that we don't typically kind of locate it. So we can sort of see power operating when we see people acting in hierarchical ways towards one another. But when we look at a building, we don't necessarily think, oh, how power is operating in this space. But uh, we can ask all sorts of questions from, you know, questions about who designed and who built it, who paid for it, whose name is on it. Um, who experiences this building as a productive, fun, useful, accessible space, and who finds it exclusive, daunting, scary, or perhaps even a violent space or a space where they might fear violence, right? So when we start to have that power lens on the spaces around us, we can ask some different sorts of questions. Um, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's not all about questions of representation, but there's still such a long way to go in terms of diversifying fields such as urban planning, urban governance, architecture, design, like just industrial design of everyday objects, which of course, you know, is part of 
how urban design works, how you design a bench, how you design a, a bathroom, right? Very basic things. And these professions have tended to draw from uh, middle and upper class echelons of society. They still are male dominated and they tend to be quite white dominated as well. So in terms of the range of experiences that are being reflected in um, the design process has been quite limited. So Yemi, when you talk about democratization of that process, yeah, it's, it's at every level from the, from the higher, highest levels to those who are you know, experiencing precarious housing, for example, or who are uh, not housed at all. And you know, obviously that is a much um, slower, messier, complicated process than what most planners and designers and developers really want to go through. But um, someone said this in a, in a conversation I was in the other day that actually not doing that is, um, is a slow and unproductive as well, because then when you end up with a space that isn't working for people, you have to go back and fix it, which is more expensive and time consuming. So actually putting in that effort ahead of time to gather the information, to really connect with communities, to understand the diversity of viewpoints within a community to, you know, uh, yeah, just really try to understand could probably save you time and energy in the long run. Absolutely, completely agree, completely agree. And um, so time, time is ticking on. I think now we are going to um, hear from you, um, Leslie, and you're gonna hear more from you. We're gonna, you're gonna read us an excerpt from the book. Yes, so it's always difficult to choose, but I thought since one of the main themes of this conversation was around housing, that I would read a little book, little bit from the chapter called City of Friends, because part of what that chapter is aiming at is not to just think about friendship, but to think about if we value different sorts of relationships, what does that mean for our urban spaces? Okay. Women's urban lives are changing. Women are getting married later in life and experiencing extended periods of independence in between leaving the family home and long-term partnerships. Increasing numbers of women are never getting married. Rebecca Traister, the author of All the Single Ladies, praises the sustaining role of women's friendships and their rising importance. She says, among the largely unacknowledged truths of female life is that women's primary foundational formative relationships are as likely to be with each other as they are with the men we've been told since childhood um, are supposed to be the people who complete us. So even though my girlfriends and I, we no longer kind of have the luxury that we did when we were like young university students of staying up late at night and, and being with each other all the time, we are still actually picturing our futures together. So sensing perhaps that most of us will outlive any men or in our lives and that maybe our millennial children will not be able to, to support us in, in the future, we often joke about soon reserving spaces in the same retirement home. And we're not alone in having this vision. Social media feeds are full of people professing their love for uh, folks like the Golden Girls with hashtags like goals. Something about the lives of Dorothy, Blanche, Rose, and Sophia has gone from seeming like a sad consolation prize to, in fact, goals. In real life, as Rebecca Traster's research makes clear, the dream of growing old with a lifelong romantic partner either seems unrealistic, undesirable, or boring. Instead, many people, women in particular, are fantasizing about an old age surrounded by friends and all of the care, support, fun, and adventure that friendships offer. I don't know if this plan for my friends and I will ever come to fruition, but there's something world-making about imagining a future centered on female friendship. Of course, the retirement home fantasy is a rather privatized vision of a space where this is possible, one that relies on personal choices and the ability to pay. It doesn't necessarily require wider changes to social structures or the built environment. So the bigger question is how could we create or repurpose spaces, especially urban spaces, in ways that open up a wide range of possibilities for sustaining and practicing the kinds of relationships that we think will support us across the life course. It's a challenging question with a lot of roadblocks in the way of an answer. Friendship is not taken as seriously in adulthood, and of course it exists in an informal and unstructured context. Unlike marriage, it's not recognized by the state and there are no formal or legal bonds of friendship. 
This is probably as it should be, but even without a friendship license, adult friendships could be considered among the relationships and values important to the imagining of urban places. But it's particularly difficult when friendship is always contrasted with and then diminished in relation to more legitimate connections, such as those cemented by marriage, blood, or sexual intimacy. It's also no secret that addressing households that don't align with the nuclear family model or typical life course, moving in a linear fashion from being single to getting married, having kids, and then being empty nesters, um, this perspective is rare in planning and city politics. Questions about gender, sexuality, and families are typically viewed as outside the rational technical box ascribed to planning practice. If traditional hetero heteropatriarchal household forms are rapidly diminishing as the norm in most people's lives, and certainly for large chunks of their lives, isn't it time we look to other ways of being in relation to one another as the ground for shaping our urban futures? Given all of the ways that women rely on one another to provide not just the emotional support of friendship, but the very material support of shared childcare, elder care, transportation, housing, healthcare, and so many other completely necessary things, would it not make sense for cities to have the infrastructure to support such arrangements? Over a hundred years ago, communal spaces for unmarried women like Jane Adams's Hull House in Chicago were built to keep young women out of trouble and safe in a seemingly hostile urban environment. While friendship wasn't the explicit basis for these homes, the notion that women would rely on one another rather than individual men for support, company, shared labor, education, and more was the prevailing ethos. Today, few such spaces exist, and indeed barriers to making shared space abound. Co-owning property with a friend is unusual and often ill-advised. Zoning practices may limit the number of families that can occupy a shared space. And condominiums and other multi-unit dwellings are often places where people live for short times as they're not designed with the needs of different kinds of family shapes and sizes in mind, thus disrupting whatever networks might develop there. Similarly, the move to break up social or council housing projects into multi-income mixed social and market housing also messes with the supportive social networks that low-income women develop to help each other survive. Ultimately, I don't think we can rely on urban planning and policy to sustain or generate the kind of spaces that non-traditional friendships might flourish in. Planning paradigms and property regimes that favor particular kinds of ownership are slow to change. Furthermore, in most cities, the private real estate market determines what kinds of spaces are built, which businesses survive, and even which services will be provided. And although I think there's great wisdom and forethought in setting up society so that many different kinds of relationships are in place as safety nets that can sustain us through illness, job loss, aging, etc., there's something radical and therefore frightening, I think, about women in particular finding ways to opt out of institutions such as marriage and even heterosexual monogamy itself. The world making endeavor of imagining a city of female friends is a little devious, even a little defiant, maybe a lot defiant. We should never underestimate the power and the threat of challenging the centrality of the nuclear family. Dakota scholar Kim Tallbearer suggests that it might disrupt settler colonial logics as well. She speaks about hetero and even homonormativity as part of the structure of settler sexuality ways of relating that value enforced monogamy, private property, and a particular set of relations with the state, which were imposed on Indigenous people and are part of the ongoing process of Indigenous dispossession. Settler sexuality is thus part of the framework that stabilizes and normalizes the colonial state. It also denigrates the value of many other ways of being in relation, including friendships, non-monogamy, relationships with the land, and relationships with non-human. Talbert contends that these and other ways of being in relation are profoundly destabilizing to colonial power structures. So perhaps imagining the city centered on friendship seems impossible simply because of this. If women dedicated even a little bit more of their love, labor, and emotional support to their friend networks, the system, as men know it, would come crashing down. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Leslie. Um, and it's such a joy to hear you talking directly about um, about about your writing in that way and to, to share that reading. Um, so there's two points that we thought that that we might um, we might talk about. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I will try and kind of jump on through. One of the things that 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 we we agreed that we'd kind of look at and explore together was this theme that you it, it 
that you talk about uh, um, quite a lot through the book around um, margins, inclusivity, who's included, who's excluded. And I noticed that when we were first chatting um, with, with Yemi and Rosie, um, who both noted a, a strong feeling of the book applying to a London context. And when I read it, I meanwhile felt that I was hearing your voice referring to experiences from a Canadian point of view and, and the associated language about elevators and sidewalks and subways, um, when in the UK we might talk about lifts and pavements and undergrounds. And, and that's about use of language. Um, you know, you say, you say tomato, I say tomato. Um, uh, but what, what struck me from that was, um, from our discussion, was a feeling that a lot of the observations that, that you make in the book about the way in which women are impacted and affected in particular ways within cities could be felt in London, could be felt um, me sitting here in Oxford, could be felt um, someone in New York or Chicago, in Buenos Aires, in Lagos, in New Delhi. And you were brilliant consistently at giving lots of different global examples about where women are working and making change um, and initiatives that that are, that are happening. And so I wonder about that balance about global issues and local issues and how when you are writing and researching and how you're thinking sometimes about the specifics of a place and local particularities, but then how much of the challenge, um, how much there is uh, of, of, of global challenges that women face in, in their use of cities. And so there, there's some points that you that you make that um, uh, I felt are really a kind of a global international discussion. Um, there's a real universality, um, universality. Um, and you talk also as well about local memories, um, memories that are held in in a particular place through association um, uh, of, of 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 or from experience. And so I wonder about your thought, what your thoughts are about how we might develop methods and approaches that are able to balance global issues and local issues and how we can tackle these, these different scales? Oh, that's such a good question. I wish uh, I wish I did have the answer to it. Um, but I, I think, again, I mean, we could kind of come back to that principle of margin to center where on the one hand, we could talk about that in terms of the voices in a particular city that have been marginalized and how do we kind of bring them to the center and say, what would make life better for these people? And then see that kind of trickle up to people who are relatively more privileged, but maybe on a more global scale as well, uh, we could think, well, what if we, um, started from a global south perspective or what if we started by looking at <clears throat> experiences that people are having in cities that are not considered the london new york uh tokyo kind of global power um centers of the world economy and so on and what might we learn from those places because i think often we kind of can replicate a colonial way of thinking in in urban studies where we assume that our sort of global north cities are you know the pinnacle of development and that we're doing things the best way possible and that we need to like export our ideas to other parts of the world when uh, maybe in fact that is well i think for sure it's not the case but maybe we could be asking what can we learn from these other uh, cities in the world that we have tended to view as less developed less um gender equal um, and, and see the ways that women, for example, are um, fighting their own battles in those places, the kinds of solutions that women come up with, um, you know, in in Delhi or, um, you know, Lagos or, you know, they they could have something to teach us here in the global north, but I think we very rarely see it that way. So I don't know exactly how that works in practice <laughs> on the ground, but I do think it probably has um, something to do with, you know, how people are trained when we think both about like even from an academic perspective as a geographer, the global north is always dominant, the global south is secondary, that's something you learn on the side. I'm sure in architecture school, the kind of buildings and and um, people that are, are taught are predominantly global north examples of these these sorts of things and I think planning practice is probably also very global north centered so maybe there's something about shifting our, our perspective there that would be a good starting point. <laughs> 
yeah, I, 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 I absolutely, I mean, personally, I absolutely agree. And I think um, there, there are so many of us who, who entirely share, share that thought. And I love the way that you're connecting that between academia, um, the way we're, we're teaching in design, the way we're teaching in architecture school, um, planning and, and, and so on. Um, and this point about this, this kind of idea of um, universality um, allows me to bring focus to, to, to the page in the book that I really valued and which is about this idea of this phrase that you use that I found so important um, of the margins must become the centre um, and and this is this is something that part W talk about um, and try to express um, and two that when things are made much better and more accessible for the needs of all women then chances are the cities are going to also be far better for people of 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 all genders um and and including men and so a pavement that is more navigable for a woman pushing a pushchair is going to be more navigable for a man pushing a pushchair or a stroller um or or also for someone in a wheelchair for someone who might be elderly and so on um, but I think, and this this is something that 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 point, that idea that what is when we make things better for women, that it is for the better of everybody, is something that that obviously needs to to continue to be making clear and continuing to to, to say. And part W is um, really relatively newly formed. Um, as an activist group, we're only two years old, and there are other activists and academics and campaigners who have been doing this work for far, far longer than, than we have. Um, and indeed, Wendy has put a, a question here in, in the chat, which is exactly, exactly the kind of the question that matches mine, which is why is this ongoing message of making places and spaces that are better for all? Why is the message and that call, why isn't it sticking? Mm. <laughs> why, uh, why indeed? I mean, you know, sometimes we have to point the finger at, at the, the, the big bad systems here and be like patriarchy, colonialism, white supremacy, capitalism, right? Like these uh, systems are, are incredibly powerful and they kind of outlive or, or out muscle our best intentions. But if we were thinking, for example, about gender, like why haven't we made a more gender equal city so that women can be full participants in paid employment and so that they are not um, overburdened with childcare and domestic responsibilities. I mean, without sounding like trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist, it's because the system as it is works very well for some people, right? It works very well for those who don't have to pick up the slack of the, that extra labor, who don't have to pay for that labor, right? Who don't have to see all of that unpaid care labor um, and, and who don't have to value it and re remunerate it in some way, right? So I think we always have to look for when we try to ask that question, it's like we have to say, well, who's benefiting from this, right? And it tends to be the groups that are already in power who continue to benefit from the status quo remaining largely as it is. And although we try to make so many arguments about, no, no, this really would be better for everybody. Everybody would be more free if we weren't, for example, again, trapped in particular gender roles or trapped in colonialist ways of thinking, like this would be better for the earth. It would be better, like in a material level, people are very unwilling to give up the kinds of privileges that they have, whether it's economic privilege, gender privilege, um, racial privilege, and, uh, to 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 try to shift that is is a kind of a monumental task. It's one that we have to keep chipping away at every day, but recognizing that it's not just about changing people's minds. It's like the systems are kind of <laughs> bigger than that, unfortunately. Yeah, and something that I notice a lot within our within our work, and I'm curious to hear uh, what what your experiences are, is that. I think we have we find that when Part W runs social media campaigns, um, when we have events, that we will find, um, and I have seen it on the tweets that we did about this event, um, that the the uh, you know, even if you just look at the number of likes or the retweets, that it's primarily women. 
And that issue, and, and, and we've had, I found it really, really interesting just in a micro way of looking at our kind of very, very small bit of part W data that for it, for example, if we're, um, when we, we ran an event for the London Festival of Architecture last year, and we noticed that just based on, on, on people's names, which of course is not, you know, you're looking at people's first names, of course, that's not um, a, a perfect science at all. Um, but broadly speaking, that we noticed that in the first couple of weeks, that 12% of ticket sales were, were to men. And then we kind of took to social media and said, you know, everyone come join, this is for everybody. And immediately we went to about 50-50 um, on, 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 on that change. And I kind of, I wonder about this, this complexity of how we, how we get all genders in the room to be talking about this. And, and if, because you have, you have so, in your book, you have so many fantastic references from so many academics um, and researchers. And if you in your work have seen what the kind of success stories are within activism and in campaigning to really be truly intersectional and, and, and to get everyone seeing this. Mm. Yeah, this is such a difficult problem uh, as an academic, you know, when we go to our academic conferences about these things, it's this divide, you know, if you have a session about housing, nobody will talk about gender, but if you call it gender and housing, then no men will show up or they'll, half of them will leave partway through after the most famous person in the room has left kind of thing. And, the, you know, the most, um, yeah, anyway, so we, it's this kind of constant question, if you want something like gender or, or, race or ability or sexuality to be on the agenda you have to put it in the title you have to make it very clear but then somehow people think uh, either they're not interested in it or they believe they're somehow alienated or not welcomed by it so it's a tough kind of line to walk because you want to you, sometimes you you want particular spaces for those conversations and sometimes you want the majority of people in the room to be of that sort of group or because you want their perspectives not to be drowned out. So you need those kinds of spaces, but at the same time, if those are the only spaces those conversations are happening in, they're not kind of filtering up to those who, who are in power. So, uh, yeah, what are some good examples? That's a, it's a tough question. I mean, I, I think, you know, in some ways like the Black Lives Matter movement is a great example as a movement started by women that has continued to really try to center the voices of women, but that has clearly um, in the issues that it talks about and kind of advocates for is really a broad based set of social changes that um, all sorts of people, whether they are black or not, whether they're women or not, queer or not, have sort of been able to say, oh, okay, there's something about that, that that vision that I relate to. So I don't know what their magic ingredient is there, but I think it's, it's it, as the years go on and that movement continues to grow and solidify, I think we could probably learn a lot from that kind of organizing. So then why, thank you so much. And, and I, I, I know it's a, I know it's a, it's a big question um, and um, really, really, really uh, uh, appreciate um, your, your thoughts on that. Um, there are some questions coming in um, which I'm, I'm conscious that we should judge you, but just lastly, we were, um, I was, well, we, I, um, I'm, I'm sure Yemi would, would share this with me. Um, was no from some of the conversations that I know that, that we've had within part W um, this issue of gendered activism and there's a section in your book titled um, within one of the chapters which is about activist to act, activist tourism um, which I thought was a, an interesting title and so I was really interested on this point that you make about how activism can be very gendered in and of itself um, and something that we have certainly found is the challenge that um, in the way in which, and, and you talk about this first hand, hand experience within the city of protest of the breakdown of mutual pride and solidarity in, 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 in having carried out a protest and then how challenging 
um, it was when it, it was exposed the kind of the divisions um, between between age and class and race and how tense it could then become in negotiating within the activist circle and how complex that is. Um, and I found this I found this so interesting because there are absolutely moments when Part W finds that in trying to do something that as a collective we might feel is really positive that um, others might dismiss or challenge um, or sometimes attack that and how um, and I really valued your uh, and appreciated your frankness and you uh, sharing that how kind of shaking that can be um, and 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 you said you were being you used this phrase of being schooled in the complexities of intersectionality um, and I wondered just a, a, as, a, as a kind of a last question from me um, about how through writing the book and through your own experiences, if you thought that some movements and organisations are, are, are where there's examples of protest as managing to keep pushing forward, despite, as you described, um, being a woman, you, you said um, a, a, a short quote of being a woman, um, a women's studies student might actually make other feminists mistrust me um, and so I, I wondered how if you thought there were particular tactics or things that you have observed from you from from your activist experience which is clearly quite extensive of 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 moments where where things are really working well and how to overcome those tensions mm, yes uh, yeah, I learned uh, a lot. Um, you know, you kind of learn from the streets, as they say, <laughs> in certain ways, like everything that I learned in my women's studies classroom was sort of like undone and then remade by uh, trying to like, you know, take that into the real world. Because of course, activist spaces, whether that's the backroom organizing or the protest on the street itself, can reproduce uh, all sorts of power relations across gender and ability and sexuality and gender identity in terms of who's included and excluded. So yeah, that intersectional lens is really important. I, I This is not specifically urban, but I would say that um, one of the things that I'm really inspired by movement wise is the climate justice movement, predominantly youth led and indigenous led climate justice movements. Um, you know, I teach at a, you know, small undergraduate institution. I teach in geography and environment. I have a lot of very like activist students who, you know, want to sort of take to the streets. And, and I find that when I listen to them speak, they, um, they already have an intersectional analysis. They're not just talking about climate change. Like we have to save the earth. They're like, this is about colonialism. This is about patriarchy. It's about white supremacy. Um, they kind of get it right it's it's already sort of baked into their worldview the way that these things intersect and interact with one another and they have a good understanding that you're not just going to be able to change the system by dismantling just like capitalism over here and then maybe we'll deal with gender 10 years from now or something like that they see how it all works together so I take a lot of inspiration from that. I hope that there has been that like trickle down of, of knowledge from generation to generation of sort of understanding that like a single issue movement is not um, going to create that radical social change. Um, so, you know, and I think again, a, a movement where people, especially white people are willing to like step to the side and say, we need to learn, for example, from indigenous people, we need to learn from people in the global south who are experiencing, you know, climate change in more immediate and drastic ways than in the global north. Like, that's another good example of people who, you know, you can have a lot of power and privilege, but you sometimes need to step back and let other people um, be the first to speak and to, to set the agenda. Yeah, and you 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 talk about that um, fantastically. In there's a, there's a there's a sentence where you talk about sort of acknowledging that sometimes that um, one um, one might be the problem. Um, and and certainly, I mean, that certainly struck a chord for me. Of um, you know, you talked about if one is if if one's kind of in a, physically in a space um, as a <clears throat> as a white cis maybe middle class women that actually um, and you talk about it particularly in regard to gentrification that actually you know you you are the problem and how how you know how the importance of needing to be um cognizant of the role that one is playing in in these issues um i'm i'm conscious of time um we've had a a, a couple of questions come in um and um yeah I mean, maybe i'll just um i might just perhaps read out miguel's and and maybe you'll pick up on on, on sarah's um 
so there's there's a question here um which is about um the context within japan um and and particularly within tokyo um and i don't know if that's a, a city that you particularly looked at um Leslie, but but the 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 question one I think is interesting uh, um, about this question from Miguel here is this kind of this tension between how um, Japan I mean from from myself of having um, visited Japan a little bit that it's an it's interesting as an example as a place that somewhere that does have and and Miguel notes here um, that does have some significant sexist problems. Um, and, and that's noted, but then they also do offer interesting possibilities for better cities for women. Um, and if you had thoughts on, so to kind of turn that into a question, if you had thoughts on, on the kind of um, the way in which sometimes the positive can also run alongside next to the negative at the, at the same time um and 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 there aren't these right answers i suppose and and, and your thoughts on that mm. yeah thanks for the question i i personally have never visited um japan or tokyo uh, so i don't have a lot of firsthand experience and to be honest it's not a city that came up that much in my in my reading and maybe i should look more into that one of the examples is um Tokyo is one of the cities, I think, where they have experimented with things like women only um, subway cars <clears throat> or like train cars or or designated cars for people to for people who are, you know, that include women, but might also include children, disabled people and others who might feel um, in danger on public transit because public transit is such a site of harassment, assault and so on for for people around the world. But uh, on the one hand, you know, that seems like a very like respectful and helpful solution, but it's also kind of a short term one that doesn't really necessarily ask men to change their behavior. It just sort of hives them off from the rest of the, the population. So this is one example that I'll give, I think, without knowing more about the context. I don't want to, to say too, too much more um, and kind of be speaking uh, from a place of ignorance there. Yeah. Okay, and I think Sarah um, Ackland fellow um, Part W members be made co-host. So um, Sarah, do you want to um, ask Leslie your question? It's a fantastic one. Sure, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, so um, I've, I, ugh, my favorite sort of chapter in the book was The City of Friends um, because it was sort of something I've not read anywhere else with the real focus on um, friendship but I think from some of the other things I've read in tan tangent um there was this kind of discussion about how women's gossiping has always been feared um and that corporal punishment like women used to have this weird thing put on them for spreading rumors and gathering in groups and so it's really like got this dark history of how we've been taught to not have these friendships in a way that we now need to reverse and so the, then I was thinking about how in in our lives that's happening or not and the only thing I could think of is that they've got the two together rail card in the UK so that you get discounts like a marriage rail card or whatever it's called and then other than that I really couldn't think about where there's space for an encouragement of female friendships or friendship in general and I just wondered if you had any other examples or or how we could create more space in the city for those those partnerships mm -hmm. like yeah partnerships, I think there's groups even yes no you're probably really right that there's not uh, that a lot of times um yeah so many of these kinds of little perks in the urban environment around transportation or tourism or mm. special like a hotel deal or something it's all geared around like a romantic relationship and if you're lucky you can stretch that to a same-sex relationship but sometimes you even have to kind of fight against that in places but if it's it's like if it's not a romantic relationship then you can't get this like hotel discount or something it's ridiculous so i think we have to keep pushing back against that some of the things that I've seen are really, you know, people just taking matters into their own hand where like um, friends working together to buy a home together, for example, right? And kind of saying, okay, we realize that there are, you know, this isn't um, the norm, but we're gonna try and make it work anyways. And then sort of creating their own um, 
you know, secure housing situation um, with the bond of, of friendship as being the, the primary thing. So in some ways it might be about kind of taking spaces that are there and doing something different with them. But I think on a practical level, we also have to kind of push back against everything from like, you know, zoning and citizenship rule, sorry, like taxation, citizenship, all of these things are based around the primacy of like a romantic relationship. So it's very deeply embedded in society. Um, so there's many layers that we kind of need to, to tackle. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, Rosie, I don't know if we could unmute um, Ruben next to for him to ask ask his um, ask a question, um, which I think is a really important one about what um, asking about what men what um, what men can do. If that's yeah. So I'm first year just begun architecture school like right now um and i i read your book two weeks ago and i really loved it and what was fascinating to me at times was that it never spoke to men right and that's something that as someone who reads a lot it's like it's very very rare that i read a book that doesn't speak at least in part to me as a man right and I found that really valid and, and exciting. And like the, I also found that the, the City of Friends was my favorite chapter in that as a whole kind of experience that is something that I don't have access to at all. And that's fascinating. And, and like all of this um, direct kind of experiential stuff is so exciting to me right now. But um, I wonder if not speaking to men was an active writing decision. And um, the, uh, part of this conversation that's been most interesting to me is like this discussion about how men can be engaged and like even in this event and a participant list in this event there's very few men um so like it's it's difficult of like the line of you know there's something very liberating about not speaking to me and there's also something about like we kind of have to speak to men to push the needle and I wonder what you think we can be doing or like men should be doing in the built environment to, to step up and whether we need to speak to men or not Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question and for sharing that experience. It's, um, yes, it's exciting to hear you, you sort of uh, like have that moment of like, oh, this isn't like speaking to me yet. It's still um, of, of interest and, you know, maybe stepping outside and saying, oh, maybe this is what it feels like for women all the time to read like everything that we're told to read and, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, when I'm not at the center, oh. But it's, it's also interesting then that that gets read as like, it's not speaking to me, right? When it's, when you're not at the center, it feels like it's not speaking to you, right? When, when it wasn't a conscious choice of mine to be like, this is not speaking to men, uh, but it's interesting that that is the way in which it's sort of read or interpreted. And I think for people, and I'll say for, for people with any position of power, whether you're, whether that's based on your racial identity, your sexuality, um, when something is, when you're not at the center, it feels like it's, uh, sometimes it feels like it's against you or it feels like it's not for you. And that's maybe an interesting, just like, you know, conceptual psychological shift that people who have, who are in positions of privilege have to have when we read the writing or the work of people who don't look exactly like us. Uh, but your, your actual question, like how do we get, um, I don't know, how do we get men to listen? I mean, partly like if I'm feeling a bit like salty, I might say like, well, you know what? Why is it my job to make sure that men listen? <laughs> Right? Like how much more labor do I have to do to <laughs> convince uh, men to pay attention? And maybe um, the men who are paying attention, like you go out and collect five of your friends <laughs> to read the book and you set up your own book club with my book and eight other like feminist books or whatever. And you get your like brothers and, and pals and like football uh, mates or whatever <laughs> to all to all read it. Um, but if I'm feeling less salty, then, then I would say that, uh, again, trying to like get people to, to see the ways in which, um, you know, feminism, for example, is not just about liberation for women, it's, it's liberation period, right? And that being stuck in a traditional gender role is pretty crappy for men too. all of the things that it limits you from experiencing and emotions that you might wanna show or ways of dressing or being in the world. Um, that it's been, you know, repressive for, for men as well. So that would be one angle that we could pursue. So thank you for the question and for letting me offer a salty answer as well. 
salty answer very appreciated <laughs> So I think um, we probably need to wrap up in 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 a minute. Rosie, thank you for your for your note saying that it's okay to run on just a little bit, um, but I'm conscious of everyone's time. Um, Yemi, do you maybe want to just pick up on um, uh, Serena Cross's question, um, and then perhaps we might um, come to Adriana, and then I think I think we'll then um, come to a close after after that. Yeah, sure. So Serena asks, how do you feel that the design of government slash parliamentary buildings can affect gender power relationships within them, their modus operandi and the laws that come out of them? And where do you identify positive alternative models, for example, Scandinavia? Hmm. So this isn't something that I've looked into in too much detail, but just anecdotally, the kind of stories that we hear about um, uh, sort of, you know, older parliament buildings, they didn't have uh, women's washrooms, for example, and the, the push to even have like gender neutral washrooms now, like just very basic spaces that would recognize that there are more than just, um, you know, cis male bodies in the space. The push to include spaces where people, um, especially mothers, can bring babies and, and young children into the building, the uh, kind of you know, radical like of uh, people like nursing babies on the Senate floor or during parliamentary debates, right? These things are, um, you know, in some ways very basic. And we think the women who have made it to these places are amongst the most like privileged and powerful. And even if, if they have to fight to be like, can I nurse my baby at work? Is there a place to pump breast milk? Uh, can I, you know, go to the washroom in a bathroom that matches my gender identity? Like, uh, even in these halls of power. So I think that that kind of symbolic message is still there in many of these places that sort of saying you don't really belong here or you know what we're also going to make you fight to to um, be comfortable in this space. So I don't know what the positive alternative models are, but I would say any places that are like actively um, having those buildings be designed to um, allow for care work to happen, to take into account different kinds of bodies that are using those spaces that are physically accessible, that are uh, gender inclusive would be steps in the right direction. So then, brilliant, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, and then lastly, Adriana, um, you've asked a, a question and thank you so much for coming along um, uh, that, that I had posted this message on the channel for the Women's Equality Party here in, in the UK. Um, and thank you for, for coming along, Adriana. Um, so you, your question is that you would really like to know about specific projects or groups that are working towards feminist public spaces. Um, and, 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 and you say in the UK now, um, Yemi and I can probably suggest um, a, a couple of groups, but, um, and, and we can do that, but, um, but Leslie, um, organizations or individuals or kind of um, researchers who are really thinking about um, feminist public space, who, who would you look to? Yeah, I don't know as much about maybe feminist public space interventions in the UK, although the work of like Christine Murray at the developer, she would probably be someone to kind of like or, or their work might be like an entry point to, to those things. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar with some of the movements around housing and council housing. So like the Focus E15 mums group that, you know, launched their, their sort of protests around being evicted from council housing a number of years ago. And I think had a few victories along the way where they were able to, you know, secure more uh, stable permanent housing for themselves and their families. So that's not necessarily a public space example, but I think we, we do see some of that like very local community oriented grassroots activism just arising out of like, you know, pure need in, in the moment, but then actually, um, yeah, actually having some success. It's nice to see a success story. But yeah, if Zoe and, and Yemi have any other examples, I'd be happy to hear them as well. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, and also, um, I'm, I'm very much aware that Sarah Ackland, who asked a question earlier, has done um, some work on mapping groups who are, are, are working in this area. Um, so, once, so Sarah, I might um, 
I might actually, I might just be mischievous and use your knowledge um, on this and, and, and maybe Sarah, we could, we could bring you back on in a minute and you can mention some of the groups that, that you working with Part W that, that you've mapped. Um, Yemi, do you have particular groups that you'd like to give a, a kind of a shout out for public space? Yeah, I would say um, Black Females in Architecture are doing some fantastic work across architecture, but the built environment gen generally. So that would be my um, two pence worth. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, my two cents. Um, well, there's loads of groups, but as far as sort of um, actually working towards feminist public space, spaces and creation of spaces I'll do a shameless plug because I work at MUFF um, yeah. so MUFF obviously yeah. Um, yeah. but also like uh, Diana Borat's work with and she did incredible work starting looking at children in the city but it really has made a lot of change for women um, and her practice I'm thinking more like practical examples as well um, yeah the map I can't pull my brain forward but don't worry, don't worry, sorry, I put you on the spot. Um, but also, I suppose, um, another thing that I might suggest, I suppose, is that uh, if not, I mean, we, you know, we could kind of name female led practices who are, you know, who are doing really amazing work in, um, in the public realm. But I think also, I feel that something else that um, is, is kind of important is, and it comes back to this point that that Leslie makes about who's making the decisions, um, you know, and who are those figures. So, um, for example, I, I think someone who has done amazing things is someone such as Pooja Agrawal, um, who works in, uh, in, well, works, has worked for the GLA, now is at Ministry of Housing, um, has set up, co-set up an organization called Public Practice, which is all about inserting um, design knowledge back into local authorities when that knowledge really, really was decimated in sort of the, the, the 70s and 80s um, uh, under a particular government that, um, you know, kind of stripped out local authorities. And so Pooja is something that is someone who, you know, I'd kind of absolutely look to as, as um, you know, an individual who's, you know, working in, 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 in that, area of placemaking. Um, also, I think, uh, you know, I know, Yemi, um, we are both huge admirers of Claire Benny, who um, is an expert in in housing, but really also, you know, sort of housing and placemaking, um, you know, and that not just thinking about housing in and of itself, but, you know, the connections with, um, you know, with inf infrastructure and, and that, you know, we can't think about um, silos. Um, are you, you look like you're looking at your map, Sarah. <laughs> Maybe you're not. Maybe you're doing some I work. Am. I am. <laughs> are I there any other? I think you might be. Are there any other you wanted to to suggest? Yeah, I saw. Um, so I put um, Parla from Australia. Even though it's not a UK example, they have made incredible documents that everyone should have a look at. Um, but then someone's just mentioned Matrix in there as well, which um, should never go amiss at the end of the day. But out of that group grew taking place who have also done work that I'm just linking um, there now. So um, yeah, there's loads and loads and loads, but I'm just thinking of people who are kind of really uh, hands-on as well. And um, there was a study that was done by a Swedish uh, practice. They did something some years ago as part of the London Festival of Architecture. It's White Architecture. Um, I may have got the pronunciation on that um, wrong, but please excuse me. Um, but they did a study called Places for Girls, which I think um, was super interesting because it was one of these opportunities where they were, well, where they were creating an opportunity for, for young women to talk about their their experience of, of public space and so that kind of direct hands-on research um, and engagement which of course is you know, massively important and that and, and I know we have to wrap up I suppose um, just that point and I think it's something that kind of comes up again and again is the importance of um, and what's amazing that Leslie does in her book is she's kind of gathering the information and the research and you know presenting the argument and what one of the things that part W talks about a lot is being you know really short of the data you know we need the data you know we need to have these conversations we need to gather um, to be able to at least you know if we have the data then we can do something about it and you know and women um, 
the voices of you know, women and, and minority groups um, so often is, is kind of has been left out of the picture and we, we cannot move fast enough to, you know, to overcome that issue.